I want everybody to raise their hand if you know how to program or use open source software. Now, if you learned how to use open source software in school or learned how to program in school, put your hand down. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> put your hand down if you learned. Sorry, let me start over. Put your hand up. Usually I do this with Ruby, so I'm like trying to make this more open sourcey. Your hand is up if you use open source software. Put your hand down if you learned how to use open source software in school. <laughs> OK. Well, basically, <laughs> I'm messing this up. Um, so usually, I give this talk to Ruby audiences. And I say, raise your hand if you know Ruby. Everybody raises their hand. And then I say, put your hand down if you learned Ruby from, you learned Ruby on your own or learned it from somebody in the community. And everybody puts their hand down. And I say, that's what I want to talk about. So it's a little harder with open source software because we all use it, whether or not we learned it in school. Um, but I guess I failed at making that point. <laughs> I'm going to move on now. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about hacking the academic experience. My name is Emily Stolfo. I work at Tengen on the Ruby driver to MongoDB. And I'm not going to talk about MongoDB today. I'm going to talk about my night job, which is teaching Ruby on Rails to undergraduate computer science students at Columbia University. I want to start out with a problem. Even with a CS degree, I didn't really learn how to program until I was on the job. And I bet a lot of you have realized that you have had this same experience, maybe after reflecting on your professional experience versus academic experience a couple of years out of college or high school. Why is this a problem? The reality is the US Department of Labor says in 2020 there will be 1.4 million jobs in computer programming. And US universities are only prepared to fill 30% of those jobs. So something needs to change. Either we need to recognize this more in the community, in the open source community, in the Ruby community, in the Python community, or we need to somehow address this in academia, and or address this in academia. So in talking about academia and hacking, I'm going to share my experience teaching Rails at Columbia, what the format of this course is, how I got involved, what it has sort of turned into. And then I'll talk about some hacker habits, which are these behaviors that I've identified that I developed outside of school, and that ironically, I'm back at Columbia teaching, and that I didn't learn actually at Columbia. So this is a curated list of five hacker habits I'll share with you, and I bet a lot of you will associate or identify with these hacker habits. And if you have the opportunity to participate in a um, teaching structure or share your, your knowledge or education with others, I bet you're going to find that you're going to be teaching a lot of these hacker habits as well. And then along the same lines, how can you get involved as a hacker? So academia is going to uh, sometimes be very resistant to change. So we can't change academia with every changing industry trend or every industry trend. But we can do something as hackers or as open source users in the community. Before I go any further, I want to say that the term hacker is a shibboleth, which means it has many different meanings depending on varying contexts. It also is used often to, a shibboleth is used to identify members or non-members of a community. I'm going to use hacker in this presentation in its positive incarnation. So I think uh, Mark Zuckerberg, there's a, a code.org promotional video or video trying to get people more interested in, in, um, in engaged with uh, teaching programming in uh, schools, whether it's high school, middle school, college. And Mark Zuckerberg describes his experience learning how to program as he was focused on a goal and didn't try to learn, didn't focus on computer science, or didn't try to learn all of computer science while he was trying to get to this goal or build this one thing. He looked up things as he went along, wasn't afraid to be curious, to ask questions, to try things out, make mistakes, fail, iterate. This is the hacker I'm talking about in this presentation. I know sometimes people have a very uh, negative gut reaction to this word, but I'm sticking to the positive sense here. I have both a traditional and untraditional background. So I went to Columbia as an undergrad. I studied computer science and art history. And as I said, ironically, I'm back at Columbia now teaching what I learned on the job. I'm not teaching anything I learned in school. 
Currently, I'm on the 10 Gen Ruby driver team. I work on the driver to MongoDB. Before that, I was at IBM working at, um, sorry, I skipped ahead of myself. I was at a New York City startup. Uh, it was called 20 by 200. It's no longer in existence, unfortunately. But it was a startup that was selling limited edition artwork prints online. Before that, I was at IBM. Um, I did a master's at the Louvre in Paris, a master's in museum studies. And I ironically ended up spending more time coding there than studying museums, but I'll talk about that in a bit. And before that, I studied computer science and art history at Columbia. So why am I telling you about my background? I think I have a pretty unique perspective being back at Columbia now. So some of you may recognize this cartoon. This is by Why the Lucky Stiff. Has anybody heard of Why the Lucky Stiff? OK, great. So I don't need to tell you who he is. Um, but for those of you who don't know, just briefly, he was a Ruby developer, very active between 2006 and 2009. And the reason I'm mentioning him here is because in 2009, he spoke at a symposium at Carnegie Mellon University called Art and Code, where he was particularly advocating for getting more um, programming education in schools. He was a big advocate for teaching people how to program. So if you're familiar with tryruby.org, that was one of his projects that has now been um, adopted by, by other people in the community to, to uh, make it live on past his public presence. So in particular, I'm mentioning this talk that he did because he said that we need to have more programming taught in schools. But the problem is that a lot of teachers, a lot of educators, aren't necessarily prepared to teach programming. They don't have the, the, the skills or knowledge or experience to teach people how to program. So what we really need is these hybrid programmer teachers or programmers who are willing to teach. And I really agree with why here. Even though he gave this speech uh, three years ago, and he was an advocate for programming six to three to six years ago, I think this is still relevant today. We really need these hybrid programmer teachers. And academia and hacking should not be mutually exclusive. So I said I went to the Louvre School in Paris. Uh, I did a master's in museum studies. But Ironically, I spent more time coding there than I did studying museums. What am I talking about? The second year of my master's program, I had to do a professional experience where I worked for six months full time somewhere and then did a thesis paper at the end of those six months. So I, by the second year, was missing coding a bit. I, I had been in technology. I was working at IBM and I'd been in technology for a while. And then I was back studying museums and art. And I wanted to get back into technology and try to incorporate technology into what I was studying at the Louvre. So I found, I got word of a project in the Conservation Center at the Louvre to build a system to allow research scientists to log samplings that they had taken from artworks. There was originally a system in place that allowed research scientists and curators to access metadata on artworks. But France is very centralized, so most of the museums are national, and all of the collections are managed by the Ministry of State, so managed by the country of France. And anytime any single artwork needs to get conserved or studied, it will come to this one institution in, in Paris at, at, at the Louvre. There are actually two ones at Versailles, but this was the main one. And the so they, they had all of these artworks coming to this institution. And since I think 1920, they had been doing this. They were centralizing them, bringing them uh, to be studied here. And every time an artwork would come in, they would take a sampling from that artwork and study that sampling. So the way things work there is you wouldn't take a painting and put a painting under a microscope. You would take a sampling from the painting, prepare it in some way, and then study that actual sample. So over the course of 90 years, they had collected all of these samplings and had no way of logging them or of taking the data they had collected from the analysis that they had done on this sampling and link it back to metadata on the artwork, which seems so obvious and intuitive, but there was this huge disconnect between curators and scientists. So what they wanted to do was build this system that allowed um, research scientists to log the location of these samplings that they had taken, in addition to the data they had collected from studying them. I talked to the woman who was the head of the new technologies uh, lab there, and she proposed this project for me to do. And, and she said, you'd be doing it in Ruby on Rails. We have the system already for artwork metadata in Ruby on Rails. And you would build this other one that would be able to 
uh, talk to the other, the other application because they had this common identifier for our work. So I said, yeah, sure, great. I study computer science. That's awesome. I can learn Ruby on Rails. I had no idea what Ruby on Rails was. Had never done web programming before. No idea what I was getting myself into. My roadmap was completely blank. And I bet a lot of you have been in this situation. So what do we do? The only option I had was to find resources myself. In particular, a few things allowed me to be successful. And I bet a lot of you will recognize a lot of these as the key resources that you use as you teach yourself things or you learn from others in the community. This example project that I had available to me, this existing Rails application, was immensely helpful. I was able to look at how this, what the schema was, how, uh, what the look and feel was, how people, how the scientists in particular navigated the system. And I was able to copy a lot of those methodologies over into my own project as a starting point and then to use it as a, a learning tool. The internet, I say this and it might seem totally obvious to you, but coming out of school and in particular at Columbia where the anti-plagiarism policy is very aggressive, this was not obvious to me. I didn't realize that the internet could be a valid resource, something that could be my primary resource, my primary reference. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a lot about that and I have a story that I probably should not share with a lot of people, but last, my last semester I had a pretty disappointing experience where someone took advantage of my encouragement of using um, code that you find online. Well, I'll let you, <laughs> I know that, so we'll talk <laughs> offline. <laughs> uh, you can read in between the lines. <laughs> Uh, trying things out. So this is along with what Mark Zuckerberg said. So trying things out, I was going along. I had, I had a specific goal, something I was trying to build, and I was making mistakes along the way, fumbling um, eventually to get to my goal. Books are not obsolete, strangely enough. Colleagues, uh, so I reached out to people that I went to school with. My father's a computer science professor, so a lot of his students were familiar with Rails. I ended up chatting with them online and getting help from them. Uh, in the, the, the lab itself, there were a lot of people who were doing internships and other colleagues that I could talk to, and that was also very useful. The community, I didn't really know what this meant, but I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, but geographical and physical resources in Paris at the time were limited. Uh, I think in the U.S. we're probably, some, we have some of the more active tech scenes in uh, a lot of our cities. And in Paris at the time, there weren't that many in-person community activities for me to get involved with. But using online communities, Stack Overflow, I never used before, getting used to that. The etiquette of asking questions online and how to use people as resources online was something that I learned throughout the course of this project. Users, another one that might seem completely obvious, but I had never built anything for a real life person who I was interacting with and talking to. This was immensely helpful for me to build this project and be successful at it. So I worked with about three, 30 research, um, research scientists in a sort of iterative fashion. I talked to them about, I, I literally went in their offices and, and I watched them take samplings and saw exactly what they did with their samplings and tried to make the system as responsive to the needs that they had as possible. And this was extremely useful for making a system that worked for them and that they would actually use and that allowed them to come back to after my time at this institution and use to um, its full capacity. And as I said, geographical and physical resources were limited. So there might be some things missing from this list, but I was pretty much working with a not so active tech community at the time. This list might have been a little bit different if I was somewhere else in the world. So this experience, more than anything else, prepared me for the job that I then took when I moved back to New York. So the job that I had at this art startup was a full stack web developer job. In particular, I'd like to share an anecdote of my first foray in turning cron jobs. We had a, um, a flash sale on Fridays at 8 a.m. We would choose one artwork ahead of time that would go on sale for 20% off. So I wrote this cron job, this system that would run through all the artworks on Friday morning and find the one that was flagged for reduction and reduce it, set the price, and then time it out at midnight. 
So the first time I write this cron job, I go online, I wake up early at 8 a.m. and I go to check to make sure the artwork's price has been reduced. And price has been reduced, great, go back to sleep. Go to work later on. A couple of hours later, I get a chat from a colleague. She says, Emily, why is this artwork 30 cents? <laughs> <laughs> So essentially, I had done something wrong with a callback in Rails. I was doing a change after create versus after save, something like that. But the point is, this kind of mistake is terrifying. But being able to react quickly, recognize my mistake, and fix it was something I definitely learned um, doing this project with the loop, making mistakes and failing many times. So now, back to the present. I've taught this class at Columbia three times. I finished my last semester in um, May. The first time I taught it was last spring. So I've taught it three times now. And the first time I taught the class, I thought I was teaching Rails. And I realized very quickly that I'm teaching so much more than Rails. I can't just teach Rails. Because there's so much that we do as open source users, um, as, as uh, people who work with web frameworks or are used to these online communities, that we take for granted and that we didn't learn in school. So after having made that realization, it was sort of too late to change my curriculum in the first semester. But in the second and third semesters, I've, uh, as an Agile teacher, revamped my curriculum and tried to address some of these holes that I've identified were there in my own education and give those students in my class a chance to learn some of those skills before they graduate and before they write those cron jobs that mess everything up. And I also want to say this type of class is rare and not just at Columbia. The class at Columbia is six weeks long. It's half a semester. It's not even a full semester. It meets once a week for two hours. I hold office hours for four hours on Sundays. And that's all I have. That's all the time I have for my students. So I try to squeeze in and kill as many birds as I can with one stone. Um, so <laughs> so the, this class is very at Columbia, and I wanted to see if maybe my perception is a little bit off because I'm very much in Columbia world, and I went to Columbia, and I'm only dealing with Columbia. So I looked up the CS curricula at many other colleges in the US who are known to have strong computer science programs, and very few of them even offer web development, which is, I didn't, I didn't even realize this is pretty surprising. So they, a lot of them actually really want to focus on the fundamentals of computer science, which is fine. But not to not even offer an elective in web programming, like forget about Rails, web programming, which is what a lot of people are doing now in the industry, is largely absent from computer science programs. I'm not going to name any schools because I don't want to point fingers, because for the most part, they are very, very strong CS programs. But they are missing some fundamental uh, education that people are largely learning on the job now. And you might ask yourself, should academic curriculum reflect industry trends? So I went to RailsConf in April, at the end of April, in Portland. And DHH, the creator of Rails, gave a keynote. And he said, um, by the way, guys, I created Rails 10 years ago. And you all were using flip phones. That seems like eons ago. But it's only 10 years. So arguably, a generation in tech is shorter than one in other subjects. I don't know if that's true, but I get the impression that it is. So you might make an argument for computer science curriculum being fine the way it is, and it shouldn't change. It shouldn't respond to industry trends. Because if you have this curriculum that's supposed to be changing with any, every industry trend, how are you going to get teachers to teach those subjects if you have professors who are tenured? You can't just bring in, I think I'm, sorry. I think I'm the only professional at Columbia who's an adjunct faculty in the computer science department. I know there's a couple in math. But um, you can't like always revamp your curriculum, bring in these professionals to teach industry knowledge and skills, because that might be obsolete in two years. So I don't know what the right answer is, but I don't think academia needs to change its entire curriculum. The, yes. The Mm -hmm. And the other argument is, you know, we're not a trade school. We don't treat yep. people. And which is soft. So yes. we're actually trying to fix that at OSU. Right? Yeah. Go ahead. To add to what you said, I think there's like a divide between like people who are in computer science academically and people who are applying. Because I mean, computer science is bigger than, you know, academic. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's a hard problem. And, and as an adjunct faculty, someone who's coming in as a professional, I'm missing a lot of context, too. And, but what I do know is sort of my emotional reaction to all of this. I'm coming in and trying to teach all these things, and I'm realizing that so much of what I do, I take for granted. And so the only thing I can do is say, OK, here's Rails. But in order to actually use Rails in the real world, you're going to have to do all this other stuff, too. So, yeah. If you were you know, looking at it from a business perspective, you kind of wondered about, like, you, know, you kind of look at, like, you know, education and there's a lot of choices now. You have, like, courses that have $57,000 master's degree, which is actually low. Yeah. But you kind of wonder, like, if the goal is to, you know, become, like, a educational professor full stack and hacker. Yeah. Um, you just gave away the rest of my talk. <laughs> uh, yes, and I will talk to that, uh, speak about that in a bit. A hacker-centered curriculum is critical in academia, given how we define ourselves. So I work for a database company, which is not, we're not a rail shop at all, but we on our careers page, this is talking about our culture, careers culture, we say that we have a hacker culture. So that doesn't show that even, like, you'd think that you would be better prepared for this, this company if you had a classic computer science degree, but we're even saying that we have a hacker culture. Etsy, are you familiar with Etsy, maybe? Etsy's another big tech company in New York. They have a um, job title on their career site called Office Hacker, who is someone who's supposed to use iPads and other technology in the office to make it more productive for the employees. And also, they have a job title called Intrinsically Motivated Full Stack Product Hacker, who's someone who is supposed to interact with a lot of the um, data that they have that's unanalyzed or unused and extract some meaning out of it by applying analytics and allowing uh, business decision makers to use whatever they come up with or framework, analysis frameworks they come up with for this data to their advantage. So that doesn't prove that people are really interested in hiring hackers. I don't really know what does. So back to my actual class. What did I actually do to address this? Because as I said, this is I couldn't change academia. I couldn't change hacker culture. I can't change everything all at once. But what I could change was my class. And I realized that in changing my class, I was able to give the students in my class knowledge that I wish I had had when I graduated. So I had all these ideas, and I, I tried to address all of these holes in my own education. But at some point in, the, in last semester, actually, when I was thinking about this presentation that I was about to do for RailsConf, I was like, wait a minute. Like, what if I'm actually totally off, and everybody does actually do this already? I need, to, I need to have some numbers and make sure that I'm not crazy, and that they actually are missing these skills, or that this class is different. So I asked them five questions one day in their fifth class. Um, it was right before RailsConf. And I shared this presentation with them. And I asked them these questions. I used something called Poll Everywhere, which was a way where I could post a question online. And they could text in a response anonymously or use a browser to send in a response. So all the answers I got were anonymous. Um, the numbers, the, the, this semester I had 50 students in my class, and about 40 were in this particular session or this particular lecture. So these numbers are based on 40 people being present in class. So the first question I asked them was, is this class different from other classes you've taken at Columbia? And if so, how? 97% said yes, this class was different. And uh, Poll Everywhere has this nice way of doing a word map of all the responses if you get um, text responses. And if I were to look at this roadmap right now, the um, biggest word was practical, modern, and then um, there are more words like less rigid, more creative, solving own problems, less focused on grading. So at least I'm, I'm doing something different from everybody else, and hopefully it's a positive difference. The second question I asked them was, if you've had an internship, do you feel you had all the necessary skills or that you're lacking in any particular area? This quote is from one of the answers. I don't know which student it was. But the point of this, me putting this here, is not necessarily that this student didn't know CSS, JavaScript, jQuery, et cetera, et cetera. It was that they had to know all of them all at once. And that's what makes the class that I'm teaching so hard. 
So students at Columbia are used to learning theory and then practicing it, theory and then practice in these very sort of modular, siloed ways. And my class, they've told me, it was really difficult because they had to think about so many different things all at once. And that's what makes web programming hard, too. You have to keep everything from the database all the way to the front end in your head. It's like tons of different languages and technologies, that, like code you didn't write, et cetera, et cetera. And so this showed me that um, the students weren't getting this out of any other classes. And I wanted to make sure that I emphasized this in my own class. Another uh, couple of things that, that students said that they were missing when they had internships was collaboration, version control, asking questions, learning from others, APIs, Unix, semantic versioning, writing clean code. So all of these things I try to touch on in class as well. And it's crazy to think back on my own education and realize that I didn't know anything about version control, semantic versioning, a little bit of Unix, um, APIs, I like, didn't even know what that was. Um, but so this was, this was also good for me for next semester, too. I know what I need to focus on. The third question I asked them was, do you participate in hackathons? I asked this question because I thought maybe I'd gotten this random sampling of students who have never gone to hackathons, had never even been exposed to this culture. And 50% said they had gone to hackathons. And the other 50%, uh, I'd say about uh, half of that other 50%, so 25%, said that they, they had gone to a hackathon, but it wasn't really their thing. So they were aware of hackathons. It's not like 50% were ignorant and didn't know they existed. And so this actually surprised me, because I thought if 50% had actually participated in hackathons, why didn't they really know hacker culture that well? And why was like GitHub so hard for them? And um, like, what did they do in hackathons? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, so I thought maybe, like, I don't really know what to extract from this, but I think, I think Hackathons, by nature, are for those students' social events. And they're not really there, like, supposed to be like teaching anything there. Um, do you have, what do you think? Yeah, I think actually um, it, it might be just kind of ambiguity. And, well, I'm not, like, there's a difference between like a one-hour hack, you know, yeah. an hour session, and then like a weekend hackathon. Like, yeah. In an hour hack, you might just put on like one topic. Yeah. I think, I think it really is a social thing for them. It's, um, it's definitely a student community thing. It's not about like learning about what's out there and how we can like use other open source technology. I really think it's, I think it's honestly about like the free food and like the other people. So um, having interacted with my students a bit, I would, I would guess that's probably what it is. Um, and then the fourth question was similar. I said, have you used open source software before? And Virtually all of them had said yes. And that surprised me, too. I was expecting a much lower number, because I was thinking, if they've used open source software before, then why is all of this stuff really new to them? Like, why is GitHub so hard? And why do I have to explain how to use the internet for code? Um, but I guess maybe they've been, they know what it is, and they know that they're using it, but maybe the, the nature of it is not really emphasized anywhere. Go ahead. Yeah. Even they don't know. Yeah. A lot of the responses were like, I use this, 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 this. Like, they were like, yeah, like open source. I use it all the time. And um, you'd think that they could take it. You'd think that having, being aware of the open source software that they use, it would have, you could have taken it one step further and, and they could have known a little bit more about the culture and the community and how to use it and maybe how to contribute to it. So, um, I don't know. Maybe I need to bring it up earlier in my class. And so how far along were they in their education before they had your class? That's a good question. My class last semester was 50 students. And in terms of the every single class, the first class, I have them raise their hands if they're freshmen or senior. And there's always a bell. So it's always few freshmen, a few seniors, and mostly sophomores and juniors. And that's been consistent across three semesters. Um, yeah, this semester, uh, when I, when I asked all these questions, they were in their fifth class. So they, and it's six classes long. So they were far into Rails by then also. So yeah. That's, that's a good point. Um, it's, it's Ruby on Rails, um, but I wish it was called web development in Ruby on Rails or hacking in Ruby on Rails, because I can't teach Ruby on Rails without this stuff. So 
I wish there was, because people come in, a lot of people think it's a language at first, and they come in and they're expecting to learn, because they, it's, a, it's an elective class, and they have other ones on Python, Java, C, and so they come in expecting to learn like a tool like that, like as if you're learning another foreign language, as opposed to learning how to write an essay. And I feel like I'm teaching more how to write an essay in some particular language than teaching the grammar of that language. And I spend very little time teaching Ruby, because for the, for, the, the, for the sake of time, I really don't have that much time to spend on Ruby itself. And then the last question I asked them was, did you have a GitHub account before this class? And 90% said yes. And of that 90%, they all said that they use it for personal projects. And I think I'm the only person who uses GitHub for people handing in homeworks. And I don't understand how people grade homeworks without using GitHub because to like track down at what point they, they like actually sent you their code, it's, GitHub is amazing as a grader because you can check out their code at a specific point in time and see if they've actually submit what they said they submit before the deadline. It's amazing. And I don't understand why nobody else uses it. Um, but that was interesting. I was, I was actually surprised by that as well, that 90% use, have used GitHub before. Hmm? Yeah, they had GitHub accounts. I don't know. Uh, for basic stuff, and it, um, Git on your own is not that hard. When you're it, Git becomes really complicated when you're working with a lot of people and you're making feature branches and you're doing pull requests and all that stuff. So I think a lot of them had used the simplest path through Git and GitHub. And I'm guessing that based on what I've had to explain in class and the questions I've gotten. So, as open source contributors, I think we can contribute much more than just code. So we, we always focus on giving back to the community in the form of code and projects, and I think that education and knowledge can be contributed as well. So five hacker habits. I want to share these hacker habits with you because um, this is my class. <laughs> On that, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, this is my TA. He's amazing. Um, these hacker habits are behaviors that I identified at the beginning of last semester, and I tried to focus on teaching. This is not an exhaustive list, but if you do have the chance to teach and you do have the chance to contribute back to the community in the form of education and knowledge, these might be things you might want to focus on because based on teaching this class now for three semesters, these are things that we take for granted that we do as hackers and that undergraduate CS students don't know how to do. So what are they? The first one, treat the internet as your textbook. On the first day of class, I tell, so we use MongoDB for Rails, obviously, with Rails. Um, and so when you use MongoDB with Rails, you have to skip active record when you install it. So on the first day of class, I show them this video, and I say, video animation, whatever you want to call it, and I say, I'm very open to questions. You can email me anytime. I have a full-time job, but I'll try to respond as quickly as possible. But if you email me a question that I can find the answer to on the first page of Google results, I will not respond. <laughs> so <laughs> I inevitably get um, <laughs> two things. I get emails from students with an entire paragraph disclaimer of where they've searched online for their question and how frustrated they are they haven't found the answer. And I get forwarded emails from my TA and, because a lot of my students will email my TA in this case. And, and I see them email him and he forwards it to me and I'm like, they're, they're just trying to get around my policy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I am getting my point across. Um, also, inevitably, the week before the class starts, I, I have a class site, and I don't list a textbook on there, but I do have a reading list if they're interested in software design or um, Ruby in particular, et cetera, et cetera. And inevitably, the week before a class, I get a number of emails from students saying, I don't see a textbook on this site. What textbook can I get in order to be prepared? And I write back, the internet is your textbook. We're going to be using the internet as your primary resource. <laughs> and that's... <laughs> And that's why I can say it's not cool to hand in projects you find on the internet as your own, because you wouldn't like copy a chapter from a textbook and hand it in, right? Um, second thing, able to debug code you didn't write. 
I do this every single day at Tengen. I didn't write the Ruby driver. I maintain the Ruby driver, which means I reverse engineer it, I add features, I debug it, I accept pull requests, I think critically about the code. This is something I bet all of you do and that you all will be doing for um, time to come. And it's something that my students are not used to doing. So how do I teach this? Their third homework assignment, I have them put authentication into their applications. I put a skeleton application up on GitHub that has authentication built in with five bugs. And I say, here's some code with, with authentication. There's some bugs. Put it into your app and make it work. I don't hear anything from my class this entire week. My office hours, as I said, are on Sundays for four hours. That week, my office hours have never been busier. They're all like, oh, we, great, we get code from the teacher. I'm just going like, to leave it to the last minute and put it in my app, and it'll work. And <laughs> I can't tell you how surprising it was to sit with the students and watch them look at errors and not think about them or not read the errors or look at the stack trace. And Rails has pretty good errors. Like, it's been around for 10 years, and a lot of people have used Rails. Uh, Rails, <laughs> Are you, do you disagree? So Mongoid has amazing, we use Mongoid as the ODM for MongoDB with Rails, and Mongoid has amazing errors. They, they tell you what's wrong and how to fix it, like literally like how to fix it. And so I found that a lot of them weren't even looking at these errors. So getting them used to this behavior was really important for um, my sanity, <laughs> for having them fix their own code, and also so that they get used to uh, having errors and how to fix them or debugging code that they didn't write. Build something to solve a real life problem. I didn't quite know how to do this in the first two semesters, but this last semester, I'm not sure I can use this idea again, but I treated the class almost like a hackathon. And I had the students build a website for me to use next semester. So I was using Google Sites up until this last, well, through this last semester as well which is sort of embarrassing because it's a Rails class. You'd think that I would, would have built a Rails app for my Rails class, but um, I didn't do that. And I had the students over the course of the last semester build a site that I would use next semester to manage announcements, uh, my presentations, homework assignments, um, emails, et cetera, or, or messages to students, grades, et cetera. And I wanted to do this, it's not the most exciting project, I tried to come up with more exciting ones in the past, but I wanted them to get used to thinking about a real life tool for real life people like themselves and like me that, that would help them do something more efficiently. And so th I was thinking back in my experience at the Louvre and why it was so much fun and why and how I was able to learn so much so quickly. And it was because I was building this real life thing for real life people who I was like, interacting with. I have them build this, this uh, website over the course of the, the class. I don't, have them do, I don't have them do, as I said, theory, practice, theory, practice. I have them build up over the course of many assignments to a final project where they, they finish it. And this was also quite good. Really? Wow, OK. <laughs> this is actually quite good also for, um, uh, lost my train of thought, for getting them used to, um, oh, right. So the, the class had varying levels of uh, knowledge in web programming or programming in general. And this was good because I was able to give extra credit and extra features on this application so that people who were, the students who weren't as challenged could run off and you know, go with those features and, and make them as um, advanced as they wanted to. And the ones who were just there really to learn the basics could stick to um, the requirements for every homework assignment. And I said at the beginning of class, at the beginning of the course, that the strongest app or the one that had the most features and had password authentication and that worked great, I would work with that student to deploy in Heroku and use next semester. So this, they created a little bit of a friendly competition amongst the students, which I think was really cool and almost like a hackathon. And I ended up having really three really strong apps by the end. I haven't really decided which one I want to deploy and use. Um, but I think uh, having structured the class like this made it a lot more fun for the students and made it a lot more real life because I would spec out things for each assignment and then they would actually implement those features. Engage with the community. I'm going to say this one really quickly. This engage with the community I think about as um, being able to engage with the community through code and in person. So through code, 
I have them in their final project uh, pair up with another student and make a pull request against that other student's repository. So I explain the, the, the pull request etiquette um, at TenGen on the Ruby driver team, we make pull requests against our own repository and have um, the, the, um, the pull request versus being merged in uh, time used for code review. So all code reviews are public and I explained how we do that at work and what pull requests are, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I think this was, even though it was just this one-off thing that they did in the final, the final project, I think that was cool for them seeing how that they, can, they can contribute to other projects online on GitHub. And engage with the community in person. In their first homework assignment, I have them sign up for a meetup because a lot of them actually had never even heard of meetup. And meetups are, I'm not sure about other cities, but meetups are really, really popular in New York. And I thought that they were particularly lucky for being in New York and having this resource. I have them sign up for a meetup. Last semester, I realized I probably should check what meetups they sign up for because I realized a lot of them sign up for beer enthusiasts. <laughs> I was like, I'm missing the point. So, um, Anyway, they're used to, they know about meetups, and a lot of them were really excited and went to like a MongoDB meetup and were telling about it. So I think that was pretty effective as well. And then the last thing, think critically about code. This is really hard to teach. But I tried to focus on um, how you look at a Ruby gem and how you choose one Ruby gem over another by cross-referencing uh, that Ruby gem with the GitHub repository and look at the last time the maintainer commit and see what the issues are and how active it is and who contributes to it, who's using it. Um, and also, um, one of their homework assignments, I have them write a rake task, which is um, basically a script that you run within the context of Rails and import data from a CSV file. And I don't explain how to do it. I just say look it up on Stack Overflow, find the code snippet. It's really simple. And just put it into your app and make it work. And you'd be surprised at how many people took erroneous code on Stack Overflow and handed it in. It didn't even work. But I wanted them to get used to um, looking at code they found online, evaluating whether or not it was worth putting into their apps, and try to really emphasize that as soon as you bring code into your app that you didn't write, you're responsible for it. And it becomes your code. So um, I'm sure a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about. The reality, again, the number of opportunities in tech is growing. So the number of opportunities in tech is growing um, at two times the national average. So as I said before, the number of jobs is growing, and the, the number of students who are prepared to fill those roles is only 30% based on the US Department of Labor's studies. And so we need to do something in both academia to better prepare those students who are graduating and taking these jobs. And also, we need to create our own academia as hackers. So we need to bring hacking to academia and academia to hacking. They shouldn't be mutually exclusive. And what can you do to get involved as a hacker? So these are a number of opportunities that I, it's not exhaustive list, just a couple of them that in particular in New York are really popular. Um, Skillshare, General Assembly, uh, YouTube, in the interest of time, I'm not going to explain all of this, but TEALS in particular is uh, Technology, Education, Literacy in Schools. And it's a program through which you can teach computer science in a high school for an hour on your way to work once a week. And New York is implementing this starting in the fall, which I think is pretty cool. You have two TAs with whom you work, two um, grade assignments that cut down on your workload. Um, but I think it's a cool way to incorporate that into your daily routine. Hackity Hack Lessons is a project by Why the Lucky Stiff, if you're familiar with it. Podcast Rails Girls got the Ruby Hero Award this year at RailsConf. It's an excellent workshop around the world for particularly focusing on teaching Rails to females. And so what do you get out of it? Your potential colleagues will be better prepared, whether you're interns, your teammates, your coworkers, your managers. Um, you can help fill holes in academic CS curricula. I thought I knew Rails until I tried to teach Rails. There's really no better way to learn something than to try to teach it. I still spend, I know I've taught this class three semesters, I still spend my entire weekend studying Rails because I want to be prepared for questions and um, it's sort of fun, like I want to make sure I stay on top of what's going on in Rails world too. Strengthen your profile, build your network, camera of course. So really advocating for this thing that I like to call hackademia, which is um, this non-exclusive relationship between academia and hacking. Thank you. Ooh. Any further questions? We're probably out of time, but go ahead. What's your opinion of stuff like maybe the famous the Berkeley uh, CS 159 uh, Mongo Fox and Dave Patterson uh, software experiments using Ruby and Rails tech? 
Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that in particular, but I know MIT has some really, uh, I think they teach their computer science 101 course in Python, and they focus on real life practical application development and um, examples. And Oh, yeah. You mean online? Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think that's great. Like the the larger the distribution of your teaching, the better. That's why I mentioned Skillshare and uh, Skillshare has an online. You can teach in person as well as online. And um, I know I really like what we're doing at Tengen too. We have education at Tengen.com. I think it is. Yeah, we were talking to you yesterday, um, which we have a, a course online now where you can learn MongoDB over a couple of weeks. And I think these types of things are excellent for exposing people who don't live in a city where there are tons of meetups all the time that you can go to and learn from other people to be able to learn from um, some of the experts or people who are most knowledgeable. Yeah, talk about, uh, or have you heard of the Starter League or programs like that? So yeah. Starter League. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. So General Assembly is pretty much, uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, they have campuses in a lot of different cities now. Um, I know it started in New York, and they have immerse, immerse, immersion programs where you can spend eight weeks. You, the idea is you quit your job, you go for eight weeks, and you are a hireable Rails developer at the end of it. And I and. <laughs> I was, who was I talking to? Oh I, was, oh, I went to speak at the Flatiron School last Monday, which is very similar. General Assembly is um, a little more focused on uh, networking and entrepreneurial networks, like people who are, who are quitting their jobs and want to start a company and want to learn Rails in order to build a prototype. Whereas uh, Flatiron School was started in New York as a pure just course, just like come and learn Rails and that's it, um, with, without the, the co-working space and all of that. that um, stuff that General Assembly has as well. And, and I was telling them, they were asking about this as well. None of them had a computer science background. They're all just learning in this immersion program. And I said, to be honest, like some of you are more hireable than people I graduated with because you're doing this out of self-motivation. You're here because you want to learn. And um, you're used to interacting with each other and learning from each other. So you're probably easier to work with on a team also. So I think these types of things are really great as well. Uh, no, but it's in Flatiron. I think they have a view onto the Flatiron building. But it's in, it's in that, that area of New York. There are a lot of startups in that area, so. All right, well, thank you so much.